Okay. So you guys have already heard this morning a lot about, um, we know the challenges that you're facing. Um, drought takes management challenges that already exist and just makes everything harder. Everything has an added challenge. You think, oh, I could go um, graze these, you know, graze my small grains. Well, you got nitrates. Oh, I'm gonna kick them into this pasture that we don't use very much. Well, you got water quality issues. So everything is just harder and um, decisions are difficult. And so it's really important to just sit down and take time and think about things and look at what your options really are. So that's kind of what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so obviously one of the first consequences is we have reduced forage availability. That can cause a lot of different production limitations. Um, cows lose condition. Uh, reduced pregnancy rates obviously impacts on milk production and weaning weights, right? Surprisingly, many times during a drought, um, the forage quality is kind of the main issue as you can get some actually pretty decent forage quality in a drought. That plant doesn't mature like it would normally and so the nutrients can be concentrated. How many of you guys have seen your cattle do good on short, hard grass versus the tall, washy stuff, right? So you can get good quality, but do you have enough of it to last through the grazing season? And usually the answer to that is no, and that's when we see um, these issues on production taking place. Um, we talked a little bit about water quality and quantity issues. I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a bit. And obviously increased expenses. You're looking at purchasing alternative feeds or more feeds than you would usually buy. We're also coming off of a really hard winter. Um, so you probably used about 150 times more hay than you thought you were going to do. So hay supplies are short. Um, looking at hauling water or tapping into rural water. I mean, all those things cause more expenses. So, so what are our options though? How do we deal with some of this stuff? And there are options. You just have to be able to, with a clear head, sit down and think about what they might be. Obviously culling is an option. Um, culling your open cows are ones that you might cull uh, later in the fall, just maybe moving that up a little bit earlier. How many of you guys have moved cows to town already? Quite a few. So um, be sure though that you're looking at production records. Um, I was talking to a vet at the West River Vet Services and he's really concerned because he's been doing a lot of um, early season preg checks and people are just getting rid of anything that's not pregnant and you need to incorporate your production records because you don't want to get rid of your really good producing cows just because she wasn't pregnant um, to the first cycle. So be sure you combine that pregnancy check data with production records of the cow. So we'll take a look at how do you use your existing feed resources efficiently, um, reducing hay waste, maybe looking at some alternatives and things like that. I understand later this morning someone's going to be talking to you about early weaning, so I'm not going to discuss that much unless you guys have a specific question for me. Um, also options of feeding in a dry lot. Um, any other things that you guys think of that you want to discuss? Or Okay. All right. So I have some handouts, like I said. Um, if you guys... If you didn't get one and you want one, just let me know and I can email it to you or whatever. Um, because I do have some resources listed on there that you might find useful. So one of the things that becomes particularly important during a drought is how you're managing your grazing. You need to be able to take a look at what your carrying capacity is. And carrying capacity relates to how much forage is produced in a given unit. And that determines your stocking rates. Okay. And so if you're not out there clipping and weighing and getting an actual number of forage production, it's really difficult to manage your grazing. So there's some tools there through NDSU. Um, if you like the good old fashioned paper copy of things, you can do that. Um, that, will go, that will walk you through get using a range frame and clippers and taking multiple um, samples from across your pastures making sure that you're representing all the different forage types and soil types and things like that. Um, we also did our environmental stewardship, stewardship specialist recently developed an app. So you can just take your phone out with you. Um, it, can you it can be used on both the Android and the iPhone devices. So um, you can just go to the store and download that NDSU grazing calculator app and it'll tell you what your stocking rate should be and how many AUMs you have based on those <coughs> clip samples. Okay.
So I know we, um, Rick and Marissa talked a little bit about analysis this morning. I have to say nitrates because that's just what we do. Watch out for your nitrates. Um, we have seen lower nitrates than I would have expected based on lab tests that were sent off after we did a quick test that came back positive. Um, there's a variety of reasons for that. One thing is these plants have been continuous, continuously stressed throughout their growing season. So they started off in a stressful situation, which might be a little bit different than if they're growing along in optimal conditions and all of a sudden the drought hits in July or August or something like that and, it, and things really build up. So um, they may have adjusted a little bit to the situation um, that they're in. Um, the other thing is, is most of the plants have fairly shallow roots, especially on our small grains. And so they're maybe not taking up as much nitrate from the soil as they would usually take up. Um, obviously there's other things besides the soil that impact that. Um, your, your fertilization management, um, the weather, you know, cloudy weather can make nitrates go up, so can hot weather. There's really no way that we can tell you um, what's gonna drive that, so just, you have to test. Um, as long as you're sending in the nitrate test, you might as well get a sample um, at least for crude protein and energy so that we can help you balance a ration and figure out what your, what your cows are needing um, and what they might be deficient in. This is going to be really important with all the small grain hay that's probably going to be fed this year. Um, I have a friend over at Lemon. Uh, the first field of spring wheat that they harvested for hay was 19% protein. Okay, that is really good stuff, right? The next week it was 8%. So from field to field and from day to day, that, that stuff is gonna be really variable. It also depends on how much grain is filling in or not. Um, and make sh so make sure you're getting that stuff tested. Um, CRP hay usually has a really um, low leaf to stem ratio. That stuff's probably gonna be pretty stemmy even though you're able to harvest it a little bit earlier this year. Um, so, so those are things that we would probably blend off with a higher quality forage or maybe feed earlier in the season, like fall, um, prior to when nutritional requirements really increase um, later in gestation. Uh, talked to a couple agents around the Southwest and, and um, one thing they really wanted me to get across was to please go and get a bale probe when you're collecting samples to send in. Um, the results that we get you guys back is only as good as a sample that you bring in. So if you grab a couple of grab samples from the windrow that's closest to the road as you're headed into town, it's not really gonna tell us um, if that represents your entire field. So if you're taking it out of the standing field, you need to walk in a zigzag pattern across the field. It might take a little time. Call your agent. They like to go out for a walk, right, Marissa? Yep. Yeah. Um, it might take a little more time than getting a grab sample, but it's gonna be a better sample and you're gonna be able to more reliably base any kind of information on that, okay? Just, just an example, um, this little chart here um, came from the North American Feed Testing Lab. So they just did an average of seven hay lots, and a lot is defined as taken off of a, of a same field in a 24-hour period, okay? Um, and they did grab samples versus 20 core samples in each lot. And you can see how the feed value was much lower in the grab samples than in the core samples. And that's just due to when you grab a sample, you're probably not getting the right um, ratio of the stem and leaves, where that bale probe is representing around 65 to 70 some percent of the variation in the bale. So it's just a really, it's more accurate way to do it. So here's a couple pubs that talk about how to sample feed for analysis and then how to interpret the results that you get back. These labs will be pretty variable on what they get back, if they give you any recommendations or not. So these are just a couple publications that can help you with that stuff. Anybody have any questions yet? Right, exactly. Because if you got, if you did the grab sample, you'd think, oh my gosh, we don't have enough, we don't have enough quality here. We probably better get a supplement. And with the core samples, you might decide we're good to go. We don't need to buy any additional feed this year. Good point. Okay, so once you have your feed analysis done, uh, really important to sit down and do a feed inventory. Okay, so we need to look at how many animals are on hand and what type and class those are because requirements are gonna vary, obviously, for your calves, um, your pregnant cows, dry cows, whatever it happens to be. 
Um, take a realistic look at feeding rates. How many pounds per day do you need to feed? How long is the feeding period going to be? It's going to be longer than you want it to be probably this year. Um, we're, like I said, we're already short um, of hay and we're looking at heading into fall and winter. Um, it's not far away. You guys know how fast it's going to come up. So it's smart to start thinking about your needs now instead of getting to October and thinking, oh my gosh, I have no idea where I'm going to get stuff locked in. Um, I did hand out, or did, did you guys hand out the sheet with the byproducts? Okay. Um, so the byproduct feed sheet came from Dr. Carl Hoppe at the Carrington Research Center. And he called around to all these places in North Dakota that, that offer different kinds of alternative feeds. And he got prices on most of them. Um, there was a few that they weren't sure about prices yet or he didn't get a call back. But the phone number is listed there. Um, so you can give them a call and, and see what they might have, at least get on their list um, if you're thinking about some of those alternatives. And I'll talk about those a little bit later. Um, but that's a pretty good resource to just go through if you're thinking about some distillers or something like that. It's got a list of contacts for you and also probably some current prices. Okay, so once you know what your feed needs are going to be, you need to look at what you have on hand, obviously. So all feed resources that you could potentially get or that you already have, um, figure out what those are and then take um, what you have and what you need and figure out what you have to get. These feed resources um, can be valuable for more than just planning your nutritional management. How many of you guys have bankers that might ask for something like this? I know a couple. Um, can also be useful if you're going into the FSA office. I would say, would you guys find this valuable if, if your producers maybe knew how much they had on hand? Um, it's also good for tax purposes too. Okay, so how do you figure out how much your cows are going to eat? Uh, there's a lot of factors that can affect forage intake. Obviously weight, 1,300 pound cow is gonna eat more than 1,100 pound cow. Forage quality can play a huge role in this. So just for an example, we'll look at intake of wheat straw. Wheat straw has around 4% protein, 40% TDN, okay? So they can eat that around 1.5% of body weight. And they don't stop eating wheat straw because they don't like it. Most cows like it pretty well. They stop because all of that fiber in the wheat straw is bulk in the rumen. So they're just physically not able to consume as much as the cow would like to consume. Whereas you look at something like corn silage, it has around 70% TDN they're gonna be able to really increase intake of that because it's high quality, passage rate is sped up in the room and it doesn't take up as much room and they can eat two and a half percent of their body weight. So that will impact um, how much the cow is able to eat. Obviously stays of production, um, whether she's dry or lactating is going to impact that. Um, and then if she is lactating, how much milk she's producing is going to influence how much um, she's taking in and then environmental factors, temperature, things like that. They're gonna eat less when it's hot and more when it's cold. <coughs> so this is just some guidelines of how forage quality can impact intake. So you look at the low quality forage, which we consider at less than 52% TDN. Um, they can eat, a dry cow can eat less than 2% of her body weight in those forages, and the lactating cow can eat a little bit more. And that's typically the case. Even as, as you go up in quality, a dry cow is going to eat a little bit less. Lactating cows are going to eat more. And I put an example down there at the bottom. If you have a 55% energy forage, 90% um, dry matter, and your cow weighs 1,250 pounds, you just take the 1,250 um, times the, you go over, and it's 2.5% of body weight. So that's 31.25 pounds divided by the 0.9, and that gives you 34.7 pounds of dry matter. Make sense? So let's look a little bit at how the nutrient requirements of beef cattle change based on the class and type of animal and stage of production. So your growing heifers are going to need to gain around a pound a day from weaning until breeding in order to get to that 60 to 65 percent of mature weight, right? So that heifer is limited physically by how much she can eat. So only around 14 some pounds per day. But if you look at the, at the pounds of protein requires and the pounds of energy she requires, 
on a percentage basis, it's a lot higher than most other classes of animals, okay? So that animal is gonna need less of a higher quality feed. So this can come into play when you're, when you're doing your feed resources. You're gonna wanna save that higher quality feed and kind of group these animals and feed them according to groups because it's gonna be a more efficient way to use your feed resources that you have on hand. You can also look, um, that next group um, has first calf heifers, second trimester requirements, and then late gestation, and then into lactation. You can see that the protein requirement doesn't change a lot from second to third trimester, um, but the energy requirement goes up dramatically. Um, that's mostly due to fetal development, okay? So, and they're also growing still. Need lots of energy for that. And you can see how much lactation um, bumps up all requirements. Um, approximately 35% from mid-gestation to lactation. So huge increase in requirements. So when's the best time to put weight on your cows? After weaning. Okay, yep, after weaning in the fall. Not right before calving, right? You, it's pretty hard to get weight on cows prior to calving. You can do it, but it's sure gonna cost you. Question? Yeah, we're well, reading your chart there. Uh, dry matter intake, right? That's mm -hmm. BMI? Mm -hmm. Does that mean a cow only has to eat 31 pounds uh, of hay at 1,250 pounds? That's, yep. So that's good quality hay. Like, that, so the dry matter intake requirement, yes, is based on a good quality hay. It will go, it, it could go up if it was based on a lower quality. And so that's why we look at the percentage of the nutrients that's required, and not just the percentage of nutrients that were, that's required, but the amounts. So the dry matter intake can really vary. That's just a, that's just a ballpark to kind of give you an idea of what I'm talking about. But the important thing is how many pounds of energy and protein they need. Because that doesn't change. I have a question. I see you have a first calf ever weighing 850 pounds. Uh, they don't sell them anymore. They don't buy them. That church should probably start at 1050 and then go up on the first calf ever, shouldn't it? Well, if you, I was figuring a 1200 and some pound cow. So if you figure that she's at 65% of mature weight of breeding and then gaining about a pound a day, in the mid gestation, she'd probably be 850 to 900 pounds. It sure could be more. This is just kind of an example. But, but people that look at this and they're going to feed their first calf heifers uh, 17 pounds of feed in the start. Is there heifers Well, obviously, so then that in, that would increase according to weight. Right. Yeah. So you have to look at the weight. the The weight is going to impact requirements. Yeah, just an example. Okay, um, getting into a mature cow, looking at the uh, requirements increase from mid gestation to lactation. Crude protein requirements are gonna double during that time. Um, obviously, lots of protein needed for milk production, and that's also gonna impact the quality of colostrum. So it's extremely important to get good quality protein into those cows. Energy requirements also go up, not quite, not as much, but definitely, um, Almost double. <coughs> okay. What does the TDN stand for? Uh, sorry, TDN is total digestible nutrients, so that's just a measure of energy that we have. Um, there's actually no direct measure of energy that you can get in the lab because there's so many things that contribute energy in the diet. So you get energy from protein, you get energy from fiber, you get energy from starch. And so basically what the lab does is calculates fiber, protein, and all the things that contribute energy, and they have an equation, and so that's a calculated number that you get back from the lab. But it's a pretty standard number that we use when we're balancing rations. Thank you. Yep. I got a question. You're basing it on a 1,250 pound cow, and that 31 pounds works out to 2.5% of the body weight, is that correct? Um, it, this, so this table was taken out of the nutrient requirements for beef cattle, um, it may or may, usually between 2 and 3%, I don't know what exactly they so used here. If you have a 50 pound cow, if you multiply that by the 2.5%, that should give you a dry matter intake per day, correct? Depending on Depending the quality on of the, the feeds that you're, yep. Yep. Okay. 
Yep, it can it can vary a little bit. Like I said, I mean the the quality of the feed will really impact yes. how much she's able. You're to eat. basing this off of a balanced diet. I mean that's yes. You know that's it's, why you're testing all your different kinds of feeds and. Correct. Yep. So, how much water do um, different classes of livestock require? Uh, lactating cow. This is this is based at um, 90 degrees, which is we've been hitting that pretty frequently lately. So, 18 to 20 gallons. Um, a little bit less for dry cows and heifers. Obviously, they're a little bit smaller. Um, Growing cattle actually require quite a bit of water. Again, it's based mostly on weight. And um, we talked a little bit about this this morning, but the water quality, we are seeing a lot of issues. Um, heard from some producers across the Southwest that have lost cattle. Um, TDS levels of 21,000 and sulfates over 5,000. Um, those will definitely tip something over. Um, Water quality will change throughout the season, so you may not have a problem now, but as things continue to evaporate, um, those nutrients are gonna get more concentrated. So be sure you're keeping an eye on that and watching for any kind of, I mean, a lot of times you can just tell by animal performance if they kind of start to get loose stools or maybe not be as efficient in gaining. The water can really impact how they utilize feed. So be sure you're looking at water quality and getting those things analyzed. So now is a really good time during drought to think about how you're managing your feeding. And there might be some things you can do to kind of change things up, explore some different options. I know nobody likes change, right? We all want things to be better, but we don't have to actually want to change to do it. Um, but there are some locally available feeds. Um, we're lucky because we live in North Dakota where there's a lot of byproducts. So don't be afraid to try some of that stuff. Talk to your nutritionist, talk to your extension agent. Um, see what information you can get on those and see how you can possibly incorporate that um, into your current feeding strategy. It's important um, when you're using a forage based ration, if you, do or if you do happen to have range resources still, um, or you're using some type of hay, low quality hay or, or hay that was purchased earlier, um, make sure you're getting the right supplement for those cows out on the range. Um, I talked a little bit earlier about how a lot of times we can actually have fairly decent forage quality. You're not gonna know that unless you get an analysis done, right? Um, but many times during a drought, I, I see a lot of people feeding cake, okay? And cake is mainly a protein supplement. It will also supply a little bit of energy, um, but anything over about 20% protein, we can kind of consider that a protein supplement. What does protein supplement do to forage digestibility? Anybody know? Um, such as like the soy hulls or distillers grains, um, those high fiber feeds won't have the same negative impact on forage availability and digestion as the high starch feeds. Okay, so you can actually use energy supplements with forage that aren't going to have that negative impact um, if you're using the fiber based feeds. <coughs> Obviously, I, I mentioned this before, feed your highest quality feeds to animals with your higher requirements, um, and then save your better feed for when, when nutrient requirements are highest. So just a kind of a rule of thumb, a pound of grain or concentrate can replace two to three pounds of hay, just depending on the type of hay that you're looking at. If you want to look at substituting some of your forage, um, if the cow is getting the majority of her nutrients from forage, it's important that you don't exceed 0.4% of her body weight as that concentrate um, because she will be able to get less out of the forage if you exceed those levels. Just because of what I talked about, um, there's different kinds of microorganisms in the rumen. There's bugs that like starch and there's bugs that like fiber. And if you're feeding a lot of starch, the ones that digest fiber, which is most of your forage resource, those are going to decline in population. And so then you're gonna have a hard time using your forage. Um, if you're looking for another substitution for forage, if you have some alfalfa hay, put four or five pounds of alfalfa hay out there and that will decrease forage intake because they'll be filling up on that good quality alfalfa. It's an option for some people.
So when you're looking at feeds, it's important to break it down on a cost per pound of nutrient. I saw some wide eyes there for a second. Don't worry, I'll walk you through it. So um, also you can look at the comparing value of feedstuffs publication that's listed at the bottom there. Um, so basically we're just trying to get this to where you're comparing things on a similar level. So we're taking out the water content, um, which can really be misleading um, when you look at certain feeds. And we're looking at the concentration of the nutrients that you're interested in, primarily protein and energy, right? So let's just walk through an example. Dollars per pound of crude protein from wheat mids. So we'll say it's $75 um, a ton. The dry matter is 90%, so 0.9. And then you take that times the nutrient. So it's 14% crude protein. And then you divide that by 2,000 pounds to get 30 cents a pound for crude protein provided from wheat mids. And then doing the same calculation for a canola meal, um, to $237 a ton, contains 36% protein, and it's 37 cents a pound of protein. So if you looked initially, though, at the wheat mids at 75, and the canola at 237, you would think, that's crazy, why would anybody get canola? When you look at how much more it provides in terms of crude protein, maybe you can afford that extra seven cents per pound of protein because you're going to have to buy less of it, right? So it's important to sit down and calculate that out and figure out what your overall feed um, expenditures will be, but that helps you do this and compare things um, on a basis that will not be misleading. Also, obviously, need to figure your transportation costs in there. Um, just put in the regular cost of shipping um, and get it on a cost per pound of your feed. That publication is really good at just walking you through the steps. It has a blank worksheet you can go through and everything. So one of the things that um, isn't often considered in grazing situation is ionophores. Have any of you ever used ionophores before in grazing cattle? A couple of people? So they're approved for all use. Um, use in all segments of the industry from grazing to feedlot. Um, they are regulated by FDA because they are an antibiotic. Um, they do not fall under the new RFD. So there, there's, you don't need to get um, a prescription from your veterinarian to use that. Um, most of, so, but they are managed by the feed company. So you can't, you can't do on-farm mixing with ionophores, okay? But you can buy dry or liquid supplements. You can also get them in loose mineral mixes. Um, so that way the intake is controlled. And we're talking like 150 milligrams per head per day. So it's a very small amount. So that's why it's important to manage that so um, carefully. Lots of benefits of using ionophores. Um, coccidiosis is controlled better. If it's controlled in your cows, that also reduces incidence in your calves. Um, it, it has good impacts on bloat and acidosis. So if we're talking about feeding some grain to cattle, we're maybe not used to it. It's a really good way to kind of protect yourself against some digestive issues. Um, also get an added benefit of increasing your average daily gain and also increases feed efficiency. So ionophores work by basically reducing gram positive bacteria in the rumen that produce waste products like methane. And so the production of those waste products goes down and the rumen just overall converts feed more efficiently. So that's how they work. Um, there's no withdrawal period. Um, really just a lot of benefits to using these, so something to think about. So a couple other options. I'm looking at maybe if you have some low-quality forage on hand, how do you maybe increase the quality of that? And there's a couple things you can do. I know some people, you've probably done this before, maybe throw some molasses on there, 7 to 10 percent of your bale weight. Um, has anybody ever ammoniated forages before? Nope, nobody's gonna tell me if they did. Um, obviously you have to be a little careful with this, use an anhydrous. You can get really good results um, as far as increases in crude protein, also increases digestibility, kind of breaks down some of those fiber bonds um, and will allow them to increase intake of the low quality hay so they're getting more nutrients out of it. Um, don't use this with medium to high quality hay or small grain hay. Toxicity can happen, um, so you don't want excess ammonia in the, in the diets. 
Uh, again, a resource that kind of walks you through how that works. Basically, you cover a stack of hay with a six to eight mil flat plastic, um, insert the anhydrous hose, you apply it at around 3% um, per ton, so around 60 pounds per ton of dry forage. Um, and then basically you let it sit. Right now with our temperatures the way they are, you let it sit for about a week and you're good to go. And then you just take that covering off. There's also um, some other treatments, <coughs> calcium hydroxide and calcium oxide. I'm sure maybe some of you have heard of sodium hydroxide. A lot of these treatments have been around for a number of years. Um, there's some safety issues with them. We used calcium hydroxide on some uh, wheat straw that we were feeding in a research trial at South Dakota. Um, basically, it, it kind of does the same thing, kind of breaks down the fiber bonds and makes it more available, increases digestibility. Um, we're feeding that at about 50% dry matter, so it needs to go in a bag or in a bunker, just like silage. Um, fairly palatable, the cattle seem to have no trouble eating it, and then we use some energy feeds like glycerin um, and some and some corn um, supplements to um, kind of supplement that. So that's another option. Um, ADM used to have an entire product that was devoted to cal calcium hydroxide treatment. I don't know if they're continuing that anymore. It's called Second Crop. Um, so they actually have a truck and they'll come over and, and you get a tub grinder and they apply it um, at the designated rate and, you, and basically stick it in a pile. You let it sit for a couple days and then you put it in a bag or in a bunker. So little more intensive with the calcium hydroxide. So nobody likes to see their cows go in dry lot, understand that, but it's an option um, to look at. There's lots of lots around the area that are taking cows now. Um, lots of different diets that can work for those situations, particularly if you're incorporating early weaning. Um, can use low quality roughages, the byproduct feeds that I talked about, corn, corn silage, lots of other things. And pound, cost per pound of energy is going to be lower on most of these type of diets than with your forage based diets. Hay is just the most expensive per pound of energy than most other, most other feeds. And you can figure that out because you're going to use the little thing that helps you determine cost per pound of nutrient, right? So if we are looking at dry lotting, th those cows still need to have adequate forage in order to keep rumen function going. So feeding at 0.5% of body weight is usually kind of the, the general recommendation. Um, starting them out on a low level concentrate and as much roughage as they'll want. Um, and then kind of just increasing the amount of concentrate while slowly decreasing the amount of roughage until you get them where you want them. And, um, if you've never done this before, it can be pretty hard to believe that a cow can get by on four or five pounds of forage and 10 or 12 pounds of grain. So realize that she's not going to be getting everything she wants to eat. They're going to act hungry, right? If any of you guys have ever done this, you need to have good fences and good facilities because they will be hungry. And sometimes it's painful for people to think their cows are hungry. But if you look at condition, their needs are being met. So it's just a, a different way of looking at it. If you're going to do this, management is really critical. You need to have adequate bunk space to avoid rushing the bunk because you can get those digestive disorders. So 28 to 36 inches per head is what's recommended. And then again, using an ionophore to help decrease bloat and acidosis. Um, intake limiters, there's lots of different intake limiters out there that are provided by um, different companies. That can help you if you're maybe looking at a free choice situation out on range to make sure that they're not over consuming grain. Okay? You don't want to get into that situation. And then if you do that, once you, you know, you're ready to stop, you probably want to be just as careful with increasing the grain, increasing the hay as you were. <laughs> it's a good idea to kind of back them down. Um, the microbial balance and that is going to be off. So yep, it will change. The microbial population will change. If all of a sudden you stop the grain and switch them over or even though they're getting enough, per se, they won't actually be enough because the microbial balance is off and not actually adjusting that. Correct. So you can see lots of conditions. Correct. It's not as 
critical switching them off of grain and back onto forage as it is when you're starting to right. increase There's levels of concentrate. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, if you go limiting, you know, like a hotter feed, then you can them out. Can you free choice draw with that too? You could. Mm -hmm. If you have it available, you sure could. Would you mix that in, or would you feed the good feed separate and then just free choice? Um, so it just depends on what you want to do. I actually think maybe in my next <coughs> slide. So there's some data in Nebraska where they actually mixed um, <laughs> wheat straw with different coal products. And, and stored it in a bag, um, and that worked pretty well. But you could also use your, for, you know, you all could also just have some feeders with with bales in it and let them pick away at it just to kind of get rid of that, give them a little more fill, make them happier, right? Yeah. So this was kind of some interesting um, data. They actually um, mixed wet distillers grains with 70% um, straw. Um, you do want to shoot for moisture content of 65 to 70 percent. Um, with, with that much straw, it's going to be tough to get moisture even at 50 percent, so you might need to add a little bit of water. Um, as you add water, your nutrient concentration goes down, so we might need to do some more adjustments with supplementing that back up. But they've actually found that this mix of the 30-70 can actually replace forage at 50 to 100 percent, so when feeding out on the range. And it, and it doesn't have to be fed in a bunk, you can feed it on the ground. Um, pretty high quality feed and can help you kind of save on your forage resource. Um, here's another one down below, just a different mix. Um, found the, kind of the same thing when it came to performance, really good performance on both those. Right, best to store them in a bag and, yep. What about just between some bales and cover with black If you, if, yeah, if you could treat it kind of like silage. And you should even be able to pack it. If, if you let it sit a little bit and let it kind of settle, you should be able to pack it just like you would silage. Um, so I'll just mention creep feeding. Um, I think there's... Uh, there's a lot of, of um, opportunities to creep feed. Um, this year may or may not be one of those. Um, you can obviously use a lot of different types of feeds, um, things that you have on hand or commercial feeds. Um, typically, people will see increases in weaning weights. That's pretty consistent. Um, however, a lot of people tend to think that that's going to help reduce your forage intake. And it might reduce forage intake in your calves but it's not going to take the pressure off that the cows are putting on the pasture, okay? So early weaning will be talked about later. Um, that's a different option for that. So creep feeding will also not <coughs> reduce your milk production by your cows, okay? Because the calves are gonna want milk production first, creep second, and forage third. So again, it might reduce how much range they're eating, but it's not gonna um, decrease any of your pressure on your cows. Then just a rule of thumb for um, price of creep and your selling price in order to make it economically viable. So I guess in just kind of wrapping up, um, trying to cope with drought, just being realistic about the alternatives you have. Um, like I said before, consulting with people that you trust and, and people that can give you some input, um, talking about your options. Don't be afraid to try something new and step out of the box a little bit. This is the time of year to do it. Um, trying to develop some options rather than sending cows to town if you can. Um, there's always things that we can help you try to figure out. So stay aware, I mean a lot of times with byproducts and small grains and all these things there's always issues, there's always things you need to be aware of. So be watching condition and herd health and monitoring that. Um, keeping a close relationship with your vet is important in times like this too. And then I guess just on the personal side, um, all this stuff can add up to a lot of stress, right? I mean, we're talking about um, really some hard decisions that have to be made when you're talking about sending cows to town, your livelihood, um, and how all this impacts you. And I was around um, for that lovely drought in the late 80s that my grandpa and my dad went through. And I was a kid, and I will tell you, these 
even as a kid, I was very aware that something was very wrong, and it's stressful. And I still remember a lot of those, you know, whispered conversations and difficult talks that were going through about selling cows, selling land, equipment auctions. I mean, it hit everyone pretty hard. So be talking to your family, talk to your spouse, go talk to someone at FSA, just talk to somebody. Don't let this um, get so overwhelming that you just can't deal with anything because you have a lot of important decisions to make right now. So I think that's just an important thing to think about is, is your own personal mental health too. So. I did buy some feed corn now. Should I, I mean, we talked about maybe that starchy feed is the best, or should I mix it in with some chopped hay? Your corn is good. Um, it, it will help you replace a portion of your forage if that's what your goal is. But again, try not to feed it at, at greater than that 0.4% of body weight. So just figure out what your, you know, you know that your cows weigh and just try to stay around that three, four, five pounds. I was thinking about chopping Um, you could, it's probably going to kind of settle out, so unless you have some kind of a binding, you know, some, something to kind of bind it together where you're feeding more of a TMR. <clears throat> so you can, you could probably just feed it by itself in a bunker on the ground. Um, I was a little confused earlier when you were mentioning that, you know, protein increases digestibility and I knew that, but then you said too much protein they're going to go out and consume more? It can, it, it can what, increase What we did intake. in 06, and it actually worked really well, is we ground straw and <clears throat> put in about five, six pounds of distillers. Okay. And then added about a lot of water mm -hmm. and dry lot it. And they didn't like it to begin with, but after a while they, and they did fine. Yep. So I guess I was mostly talking about in a range situation where yeah, you're we're feeding just to start doing it pretty quick. Yeah, where you're just feeding um, where they just have access to range and they're eating a protein supplement, they no, will still go out and hustle up forage. Okay. But when you're feeding wheat straw and you've got that fill factor that's yeah. kind of limiting. Yeah. But distillers is distillers is a great your, distillers is by far our best buy for protein and energy and yep it's both it'll it'll yeah. provide you both so you can use it in a lot of different ways right yep and adding water definitely helps the ration be way more palatable and they consume it better yes <coughs> yep i was a little confused by that too so cake isn't necessarily the best thing to try to stretch your grass with right okay yep Now, it can't, you can get high energy cake that maybe has a little bit lower protein levels and it also depends on what the main uh, ingredient is in the cake. So if it's like a plant-based product or wheat mids or something like that, you can be supplying both. But again, it's really good to get a nutrient analysis on your forage so that you know if you're short protein or energy or both. And then pick your supplement based on that. Don't just assume that the supplement you used last year is the best one this year because it, it changes with these different conditions, especially in drought, the forage quality changes so much. <clears throat>